and up at uh, Beach Lake with such an honor song. And Hartley White, longtime chairman of the Beach Lake Band, I complimented the singers afterward and said, that song has been on the hit parade of my people for 2,000 years. <laughs> and I think it's important for us to remember that this is reflective of a culture that is over 3,000 years old. And we're so honored that you come to share your heart, your soul, your spirit, and the music moves the Anishinaabe people and marks your culture as unique among us, the first among us.
saying this should not be subject to contract negotiations, and the NLRB agreed with them and said that health insurance and retirement are not appropriate subjects quote, for contract negotiations. Harry Truman came up here to Duluth, and then he went up to the Iron Range to the <laughs> Memorial Building. We had 7,000 people up there. He saw the steel workers. He knew what this meant. He was the guy who had the guts to try to seize the steel companies when, when they tried to shut down the strike. Uh, and <clears throat> after the election, he replaced the chairman of the National Labor Relations Board in 1949. And in 1950, the Steel Workers Union appealed the previous decision. And the board ruled that retirement and health insurance are extensions of pay, quote, extensions of pay and proper subjects for contract negotiations. In 1952, the next four-year contracts, the next contract was up, the miners were on strike for 150 days. I got lunch buckets out to go pick a mine for my father. We had soup five days a week. And I complained on a Friday saying, what, soup again? My father says, you're damn right, we throw soup on up in the air and it comes down, we got soup next week too. We'll cook it until it's gone. <coughs> you think I was gonna vote against health care for all Americans? Hell no. <laughs> now we have a member of Congress, Rick Nolan, who will stand there to make sure it stays in place. That will never be taken away from you. We served for six years together. And Rick represented the district and now is largely represented by Michelle Bachman. Now it's just gotten worse since he represented. But he asked me to come with my late wife, Joe, and we went with Rick, and, and uh, we're, uh, I said, oh, this is going to be a breeze. We had, had a camper, we started out in St. Cloud, we went towards Sock Rapids, we went to Sock Center, and we walked in the uh, cafe at 7.30 in the morning, where all the farmers were sitting around their bib overalls, and I said, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. He said, no, listen. And from the, from the captain's table came this stage whisper, here comes that goddamn Nolan. <laughs> I said, well, Rick, this isn't so good. And some, someone else said, oh, he's got that overstar with him. Well, maybe let's be nice. <laughs> but they weren't nice. He didn't flinch. Rick didn't back down. And he reminded them, listen, we've been out there fighting for your milk price increases. We've been fighting for fair, decent equity for dairy farmers. And you know, and it wasn't good enough. It wouldn't back down. And we'd have top votes on the floor, and I'd say, Rick, don't vote like I do. You know, you don't have steel workers in your district. <laughs> you don't have the building trades in your district. You don't have others. He said, this is the right vote, isn't it? I said, yes, it is. But not for you. It's good enough for you, it's good enough for me. We come back, this is what I'm saying, on Friday, you know, we work Monday through Friday in those days. And we had hearings five days a week. We come back on Monday, I said, Rick, how'd it go? He said, oh, you were running up. That's beating out of me over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't back down. He did the right thing. He didn't take a politically easy way out. He told the truth. He's got a rod of steel in his back. Thank you all.
the elder of the Bible Act, our nearest uh, community. We have a flag that, that we'd like to show you, and we'd like to present it to our Congressman Rick Nolan. Uh, this is for display in the Congressional Office in Washington, D.C. My name is Sally Klein. I also represent the Beltrami County DFL, and I've been a co-chair there for approximately four or five years now. One of the things that we did at Leech Lake was we had a well-funded campaign of on-the-ground grassroots organizing, and we're very proud of the work that we've done here. We're very proud that we were instrumental in, in electing such a fine leader at Congress who's going to represent us, Chimi Butch, Congressman Nolan. Yeah. <laughs> 
Good evening. <laughs> I just want to begin um, to say how glad I'm here. I'm glad to be here to see Rick Nolan and uh, celebrate with this whole group tonight. But I wanted, there's two groups of people that Leech Lake had really um, contributed to the um, campaign here in Minnesota in the 8th District. And I want to acknowledge the canvassers. But these, are the, these are the folks that went out and got people registered and then um, helped them to the polls in the next year. They worked uh, really hard, and the young people, I thought, uh, really showed me up, I'll tell you. Uh, the second person is Carol Jenkins. She also is one of our cancers. <laughs> and uh, the other four are not able to be here tonight, but I do want to toot my horn about this. We registered, our canvassers registered 729 new voters. Responsibility. 
as I'm, I'm sitting there and listening to, to what's being said. Um, I, I'm silently uh, saying my own prayer and my own wish uh, that I will, in my service, merit the great trust and the great confidence that you have placed in me. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I assure you that I will give it every ounce and every bit of passion and ability that, that I possess to represent you honorably and effectively and to enter and, 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 and with the kind of energy that will be able to make a difference in Washington. And and um, I must I must tell you, um, with the great support that you have given uh, to me and to our party and, and to our campaign, comes a, a real positive energy that I quite frankly don't know quite how to explain, but I can tell you I feel it. I feel more ready, I feel more prepared, I feel more determined to go forward and to make a difference because you matter and this district matter and this nation matters and I've never felt stronger and better in my life. I feel great. But I owe that to you, and I shall be forever grateful. I would be remiss if I uh, to get uh, take care of a few things here if I didn't say uh, miigwetch, thank you, uh, to the uh, Leech Lake Band, the uh, um, the, uh, the the men who who, who sang and, and drummed here for us, the. Uh, Oh, I want to make sure I get this right. I studied a little Arabic, a little French, uh, uh, a little Spanish, a little Latin, a lot of English. Um, I, I got to start working on, on, on my Ojibwe. But uh, uh, thank you so much to the Ashki uh, Gishik uh, female singers that introduced us here. There's so many other, you know, thanks to, that need to go around to Colleen Nardone and to Don Bai and for the leadership that they provided here in the 8th Congressional District. And I got to tell you, uh, Marge Hoffa, Ken Martin at our state DFL, I, I don't know that we've ever had finer leadership in the DFL party than what we have now. As a result of, of that strong leadership and uh, these people standing up uh, determined, determined to let people know that this DFL party, this DFL endorsement system, uh, everything that we stand for and that we represent, to let people know that we matter, uh, that is what brought us to the point where for the first time in over 20 years, we now have a Democratic governor, a Democratic House, and a Democratic Senate. And we are ready to leave, ready to get this country back on track. Um, as we were uh, sitting here, I was reminded with regard to the Republicans of an old, an old joke. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to revise it here just a little bit. Um, and it goes something like this. I'm going to bring it up to date. Uh, there was this Tea Party Republican uh, who was winning elections. And uh, it should come to you as no surprise that he wasn't particularly bright. Uh, but he had, had a woman who was writing speeches for him. And it shouldn't come to you as any surprise that she was very bright. And she could write these brilliant speeches. And they were so good that he didn't have to look at them, even. He could just get to a podium like this, pull them out, read them. And he was a brilliant speech writer, reader. 
So that's how he managed to get elected to the Congress of the United States. I don't remember if his name was Chip Cravac or not. <laughs> but anyway, the whole argument came about the budget and the deficits and the fiscal cliff and the great issues of our time surrounding that. And like I said, he wasn't particularly bright. And um, he, he never bothered to say thank you to his speechwriter, nor did he have the good sense to pay her. Um, uh, as you know, Republicans uh, don't believe in equal pay for, even for women. So he wasn't paid her, and she was getting kind of fed up with this guy. And uh, so he came to her, and he said, you know, people are saying I'm so good that I should run for president. And I've, I've got a big speech before the National Chamber of Commerce. So I want you to really bear down. You know, your speeches haven't been as good as they could be. And I want you to write, you know, a speech that will really launch my presidential campaign. And so she sat down determined to write a, a speech that he would never forget. And, and indeed she did. And the big moment came before the National Chamber of Commerce. This fool's gonna launch his presidential campaign. And he pulled that speech out. All the cameras were there, NBC, CBS, you know, the whole works. The cameras are all, the lights. Uh, he's getting pretty excited about this big moment. And he pulls that speech out and he starts to read it as only he could. And as he read through that first page, they started interrupting him with ovations. And oh gosh, you know, the, the more they cheered, the better he got. And he turned to the second page. It was better than the first page. I mean, they started interrupting him with standing ovations. And as he waited for the crowd to subside, why uh, he was envisioning, you know, he and his buddies watching Monday Night Football in the East Wing while the spouses were having a gathering in the West Wing. And he could see the kids playing in the White House lawn and uh, build, build tree houses. I mean, it was all coming together really great. And so he was reading along toward the bottom of the second page, and it said in there, so my fellow Americans, I have for you tonight a plan to cut 12 items out of the federal budget, each bringing about a savings of $1 trillion. Yes, $1 trillion for a total savings of $10 trillion. And yes, a balanced budget. Not only a balanced budget, but a budget and cuts that can be done without cutting any of the services to you, the people. And not only will it have that effect, it will put an end to unemployment, give everybody a job, it'll lower interest rates, it'll reverse the deficit in our balance of trade, and just create a, a prosperity that will go on, on phenomenal, you know, into the future. And I know how tired you all are of false promises and glittering generalities from the politicians of our day. And so I'm here to give you my program in specific and in detail. And he turned over to the third page and there was one line at the top. Said, okay, big shot, you're on your own. <laughs> says it all. Well, um, we sure have good reason uh, to be proud of our President Barack Obama. He's, he's made it clear, he's made it clear that he's willing to work with them and that he's willing to, uh, to make some compromises. Um, he's willing to collaborate, but he is saying, and rightfully so, <coughs> that any kind of a deal to avert this so-called fiscal cliff is going to have to result in an increase in the rates for millionaires and billionaires. <laughs> He's put an end to the wars of choice in Iraq. He's winding down the war in Afghanistan. And there is more trillions of dollars that we can put to work rebuilding America. 
president has made it clear that it's time to take some of the monies that we've been using in this so-called nation building abroad and start using it to rebuild America. Our roads, our bridges, our schools, our hospitals, and indeed the, the, the Northern Lights Rail Express from the Twin Cities to the I guess if there was any disappointment uh, in this election contest, it was that the Democrats uh, didn't gain control of the U.S. House of Representatives. But I gotta tell you, there's a lot that can be done, and thank God our president is there, our senators Klobuchar and Franklin are there, the Senate, the, the, the Democrats control the Senate, there's a good chance that we can reform the filibuster, and we may not have control of the House, but we have leverage, and we are gonna use it, and we are gonna fight for the people in this country, and we are gonna make a difference in, in, in the House of Representatives as well. And thanks to you for that opportunity. Uh, forgive me uh, for going back just, just a little bit here uh, in, in my thanks. I, I said thanks to, to, to Ken Martin um, and to the DFL and the endorsement system. We proved that it still works. Uh, we won the caucuses. We won the county conventions. We won the district convention. We won the primary. Uh, we had we had the message, and we had the boots on the ground. We had the people who were willing to get out there and work and spread uh, that message. Uh, the phone calls that were made, the literature that was dropped, uh, the envelopes uh, that were stuffed, the uh, rides that were provided for people going to the polls. Uh, I, I've said in this campaign. Uh, we may have gotten outspent. We may have gotten outspent. But by God, we had a better message, and we had more support on the ground, and that's why we won this election. You, you heard from my good friend Brian Rice, uh, who was our finance director. What a great job he did. And I have enjoyed saying, you know, Chip Kravak and the Republicans, they may have had Sheldon Adelson and, and uh, the, the Koch brothers, but we had Minnesota's 8th District DFL and the Rice brothers. <laughs> we raised uh, millions of dollars, something I never <coughs> dreamed or imagined would be uh, necessary or, for that matter, uh, uh, possible. Um, and in some respects, I, I, I have to tell you, I feel a little bit like Rick Van Winkle. Um, I, 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 I took a nap here about 32 years ago. I was serving in the Congress at the time. And I woke up and damned if I wasn't still in the Congress. Um, we, we had a little go around uh, in Washington introducing ourselves. And uh, when it came to me, I said, well, my name is Rick Nolan. And I'm a uh, new representative from the uh, Fighting 8th District of Minnesota, and uh, I see there's a few gray hairs here in the room. Uh, perhaps some of you remember my father who was elected 38 years ago. <laughs> and the other half of the room said, what's so funny about that? <laughs> it wasn't his dad, it was him. <laughs> but you know what, I got a little seniority that goes with that. And uh, it, it, it showed itself uh, first here, well, just when it came to selecting the offices, you know, there's 435 of us, and some offices are closer to the Capitol, and some have a view, and some are bigger, and some are more spacious than others. And so by virtue of my seniority, I got to, to going ahead of the rest and to, uh, to, to uh, select my office. And it was particularly uh, enjoyable when uh, Michelle Bachman was sitting there in the room saying, how come he gets to pick an office ahead of me? <laughs> districts here in the state of Minnesota. And if any of you run into uh, any of them, encourage them. 
uh, uh, all of them, but particularly this Jim Gray. So I encourage you to run him. What a great man. I have um, reminded people, I have reminded people that, um, that uh, there are a number of people who had to run uh, and get beat the first time they ran for Congress. People like Colin Peterson and uh, people like uh, Bob Berkland and people like the senator from Iowa, Tom Harkin, and yours truly, Rick Nolan. I got beat the first time I ran too. So if you see those people, encourage them. And uh, I'm convinced that it, 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 at least one of them, if not all of them, can win in the next election if, if we get behind that, behind them. Now, in, in thanking people, I would be remiss if I didn't say something about the, the great support that um, this campaign received from our brothers and sisters in the union movement. It was unfair. <laughs> I sensed something was happening when we were all together down at the state capitol uh, lobbying against uh, Republicans' attempt to uh, stick us with right-to-work laws and other efforts to diminish our collective bargaining rights. And I, I saw labor stepping up like it has never stepped up before in my lifetime. And I gotta tell you, um, my brothers, our brothers and sisters in labor, uh, they were sending out letters, they were knocking on doors, uh, they were deep digging deep into their pockets for contributions uh, to our campaign. Um, they were leaving no stones unturned, and they made it clear to every working man and woman in this district that elections matter, elections have consequences. There's a war against the working men and women in this country. It's the union movement that created good jobs, wages, and benefits, and we need to stand behind our brothers and sisters and the union movement. Jim Oberstar, not just here in this district, you know, but, but all over this nation. And uh, we just never had a finer representative, and the thought of having to fill uh, his shoes is, is a little bit daunting. But I, I, I got to regret to digress and tell you this one little story. You know, Jim was telling the story about how tough it was um, out there in what was then the old 6th District. Um, and for those of you who don't, uh, don't know, uh, a little bit younger here. Uh, I haven't moved. The districts have moved. What I used to represent in the State House and in the Congress was the southwestern part of the 8th Congressional District. But back in that day, then it went down to the south and the west. And of course now it's there, it comes up to the, to the, to the north and, and to the east. But um, uh, Willard Munger, who was a representative uh, here from Duluth, uh, was a good friend and a good mentor to me when I was a young man. And uh, Willard always said, you know, I'll tell you something. We, we just had a tough vote in the House of Representatives. One of those votes where everybody said they knew what the right thing to do was, 
uh, but it was so damn difficult politically, nobody wanted to do it. So um, Willard and I and, uh, you know, a couple of other kamikazes, we did the right thing and, and uh, we, we voted the way we should. I, I think it was on the marriage amendment or the DOMA. And there were only three or four of us that, that, that voted against it, including Willard. Willard came over and he, he put his arm around me and he says, you know, young man, he said, uh, I want you to know, um, uh, I saw that vote and I heard you speak up and I want to tell you something. Um, if you do what's right, if you do what's right, like you just did today, you'll always be proud of your time in public service. And so that, that's what I always tried to live by. It's always what I tried to do. So among other things, I, I became a strong advocate for gay rights and I became a, a strong advocate uh, for uh, equitable milk pricing for dairy farmers. And um, at the end of each election, um, nobody was more surprised than I was when I, when I would end up getting elected. And um, the Republicans all across the district would write letters to the editor in every weekly newspaper after I'd won, expressing puzzlement, saying, how many gay dairymen can there be in our district? <laughs> True story. You can't make that stuff up. <laughs> so, um, but you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm proud. I'm proud of my support for dairymen, and I'm proud of my support for the gay, lesbian, bisexual. <laughs> well, um, believe it or not, as Jim pointed out, there was almost like 20 you know, over $20 million uh, spent in, in this election contest, and, and that's, that's just wrong. It's, it's toxic, um, and I mentioned before that I felt a little bit like Rip Van Winkle, and you know the old saying how things change, and, and yet at the same time, um, they, they, they seem similar. And I gotta tell you, you know, being in Washington, my wife Mary and I were out there uh, for a week before Thanksgiving, and uh, a week after Thanksgiving, uh, getting to know um, many of the other members, both the Republicans and the Democrats. And the good news is that they all seem to have gotten the message in the last election that uh, people want their representatives uh, to start working together, to start collaborating. <laughs> solutions and, and don't be afraid to compromise uh, where, where it's appropriate so as to be able to get things done. But I tell you, tell you uh, and so I, I, I'm optimistic about those prospects and I, I'm going to be searching out not only my Democratic colleagues uh, but Republicans where we can find common ground to fix things and, and to get things done. So you know that's important but I got to tell you the, the, the one part that it is a source of some dismay is, and that is the role that this money is playing in the process. Uh, we've been told, we've been told by the pundits, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, that if you want to get elected in the next election, that you should spend 30 hours a week in call time. And, and both parties have a, have, have a floor and some offices a block and a half away from the Capitol. Uh, made up of little cubicles for the members of Congress to go over there and sit there on, on the telephone, uh, dialing for dollars, calling people you don't know, never heard of, and, and uh, asking them for money. That's time that we used to spend in committee. That's the time we used to spend with our constituents. That's the time we used to spend, you know, learning and getting to know one another and getting a better grasp of the issues and finding and seeking solutions and developing respect for one another. Um, I don't uh, mind telling you, I'm, I'm proud of, of my service uh, in my youth, um, and I was uh, an effective legislator. I was a good legislator. I was able to get things done. Thank you. But I gotta tell you, I always had a Republican partner in everything that I ever did. We passed the Rural Policy Development Act. I, I, I worked with, I'm sure Chuck Grassley, who I worked with on that, bragged that it was his bill, you know, when he was in Iowa. Or the uh, Railroad Abandonment Legislation, with Frank Skubitz, a 
unbelievably conservative, crusty old Republican from Kansas. But he was my partner in that. Uh, creating a World Hunger Commission, a presidential, you know, Ben Gilman from New York. I always had a Republican partner. Um, but that's much more difficult in, in today's Congress. And so I'm going to fight to try to change uh, the way we do our politics and, and the way we work in the Congress. And until we do that, it's going to be very, very difficult uh, to move forward on so many of the other uh, great issues of our time. And I've spoken with uh, the leadership uh, in the House, and I've got to tell you, the very first bill that I am going to introduce uh, with the Democratic leadership in the House of Representatives is to reverse the United the Citizens United decision. <laughs> Right behind it is going to be a bill to provide for public financing for federal elections. So the congressmen are beholden to the public, not the most about financing. And I'm going to add another little wrinkle to it. Um, you know, many of the great democracies of the world, uh, they don't start their election contest the day after the election. Um, they have, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 day election contests. And I think we need something uh, of the same sort. You hear this, this notion that uh, everybody's campaigning and nobody's governing. Well, it's literally true, and it's time that we put an end to that and, and that we change that. So uh, that, that's what we're going to do to, you know, to, to, to kick things off. And I, I keep uh, regressing here a little bit because I don't want to miss anything. I wanted to thank Lori Swanson. Is she still here? Uh, what, a, what a great attorney general that she has been. And I, I don't mind telling you, uh, Lori said she was watching uh, our campaign up here in the, in the, in, in, in the 8th District. Well, uh, indeed she was. But I got to tell you, she was also calling her friends and dialing for dollars, helping us raise money uh, for this kind of <coughs> And as I said before, uh, we may have had more money, but I tell you what, uh, we, we, we defeated them with all of our support that we had uh, here in this district. So uh, the prospects, you know, for the future, in my judgment, uh, have, have never, never, ever looked better. Um, we, we've gotten ourselves into a great deal of trouble um, with deficits that are unsustainable and wars that we had no business being into and, and unemployment and joblessness and, and growing uh, inequalities in, in our economy. But I think we are poised better than any time in modern times to reverse all of that and to get this country uh, back on track. And it's in no small part due to the important uh, role that we've all played as Democrats in this last election, not just here in the 8th District, not just here in Minnesota, but all across the country. And we won this election, and we're going to win future elections, because we stood up for the middle class and not just millionaires and billionaires. And people recognize that. stood up and we recognized that Social Security and Medicare are not entitlements, they are earned benefits that people started paying for. And we are not going to retreat from that, and I was so delighted uh, this morning where I heard our president has said, that's something that we're not compromising on either. Those um, and, you know, we, we've stood up for the poor and the less, fresh, less fortunate in our country, in our society, and uh, the people that have been forgotten, uh, the people that have been left behind, that Democrats uh, always cared about. And we also know and understand that building a strong middle class with good jobs and good wages and good benefits. That, that, that's, the, that's, that's the step out of poverty, and, and you have to help build and prepare people uh, to make that step. 
And as more and more people have slipped into poverty as a result of Republican policies for a generation or two, they now too have come to realize uh, the importance of all of that. So um, we are uh, poised, as I mentioned earlier, to start rebuilding America. We are poised to still move forward with a single payer universal national health care plan. We uh, are going to rebuild America. We're going to stand up for our union brothers and sisters and bargaining rights and help strengthen their ability to organize the workers of America so that we can ensure living wages and health care and benefits. We're going to stand up for public employees who go to work every day uh, serving and taking care of us in our community. We're going to stand up for teachers who educate our children and lay the foundation. We're going to start showing gratitude and appreciation for the great service that our veterans have provided in representing and defending this great nation. We are going to continue to stand up for issues of importance to women, their reproductive rights, their right to equal pay, their right to that use, utilizes less energy. It's transportation that takes uh, the great stress that is now on our air and our interstate uh, transportation system. It is indeed the modern version of the interstate highway system. And it's good in every respect. And so uh, make no mistake about it. Uh, be caring about your environment and your air and your water is not only good for your air and your water and your health, it's good for job creation. If you're... <laughs> you, you, you go and you put uh, scrubbers on the coal-fired power plants uh, 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 across this nation and, and you make them put catalytic converters, in the automobiles, and guess what? You take the sulfur out of the air, you created jobs for people building scrubbers and building catalytic converters and maintaining and repairing them. That's what this is about. So we're going to keep on fighting. We're going to keep on pushing. We're going to keep on shoving. We're going to do everything we can to put this country back to work, to get this country's economy 
growing and creating jobs and rebuild people's trust, rebuild people's confidence, in the process, create opportunities and restore the dream, the great American dream, where anybody who is willing to step up, work hard, study hard, will have a job, will have an opportunity, and will have hope, and will have promise for their family and for their community. Thank you all very much.